Okay, we won't be long. If I quit spitting, we won't be long with this. Uh, in a sense, I wanted to mop up a couple of things I, I sort of started thinking about that uh, I don't even think I explained correctly or just left out. But let's start with this strange word, which is. Oh. Paradis. <laughs> Paradis. According to the dictionary.com, Paradis. The I is long, and this is the two O's with the little smiley face on top of it. If you, if you can figure all that out, Paradis. Itching. I hate these Latins. Why do they come up with the word? Why can't they just say itch? I, I have an itch. You know? Paradis? Where does that come from? Anyway. Uh, blame the Latins. Uh, we, we ran across that the other day, and I was like, Paradis. Now, you can use it to have a pretty good joke. You know, you say, I can't go to school today, Mom. I have Paradis. And we need to call the doctor. I don't know. Maybe I'll get over it. <laughs> just leave. Go to work. I'll, I didn't think so, kind of. I'll be fine. I, I just need rest. Paradis. I have Paradis. <laughs> now, that's like severe itching. I wonder if you have like one itch, if it's like the parati or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, parati. <laughs> Paratus. Paratus. Okay. On with the rest of the allergic reactions. Now that we cleared all that up. This, this IgE that we talked about, this what? Immunoglobin? Immunoglobin? Immunoglobin E. I got disinterested in it, and I didn't look up what the E stands for. I just lost interest, okay? But those are the antibodies that we talked about. We talked about that, those IgEs. Now, I'd mentioned in there that, hey, you have to have an exposure to have an allergic reaction, and I forgot about these, okay? This anaphylactoid, right? Uh, would that... Is that the way you say it? Anaphylactoid? An anaphylactoid? Did I, did I spell it wrong? I don't know. I don't know. It's a big word. It looks good. Okay. Anyway, this, when you see this word, this is an, an allergic reaction where you can have without an exposure. It's a first time exposure. A lot of medications take this type of reaction. It's essentially a non IEG reaction. So the these don't these antibodies are not the cause of it. But where this comes in is that you know a person takes a medicine for the first time and has an allergic reaction. I just didn't want to leave you guys hanging, think that you have to have an exposure to everything. There are there are things that you can have a first time reaction to. Okay. Uh, this IgE, okay, binds with the antigen, it activates this. FC in the, and I just wasn't having a little stroke. All these, they're little lowercase c in the abbreviation, so F C E R I, receptors on the mast, mast cell or basal field, right? We talked about that, and then it binds that and it releases the histamines, okay? And the histamines causes most of the problems that we have in allergic reactions, okay? So, while you guys were during your test, I looked up this IgE picture of it. Yes, there are better pictures <laughs> on, on the internet, okay? They're in color, but it has this sort of funny shape to it. But in most of the times, you see them drawing it as a Y, and that's why. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that one off the cuff. Anyway, uh, so it, it has all these different parts, and this region right here is the FC region. I don't know what that means. I don't really care. Okay, and and then the RI region, and these different, and this this site over here is the binding site that binds to the the mast cell. Okay, anyhow, uh, for sure. Hey, let's make this easy. Let's just draw a Y. But this is something. That if you're going into medicine or something, medical school, you, when you when you take biochem, uh, these things 
immunology. You could probably take a class somewhere along the way in that. But uh, you, you run into this, and then you have to know what all that stuff means long enough to take your test. And then if you're not a scientist, then you put all that stuff away. You forget it, you know. You don't, you don't use it, but if you're in research and science, then that, these things here would probably be important to you, you know, like algebra. If you're going to be an engineer, all those, that algebra stuff is pretty important. If you're not, then you spend the time going, why? Why should I have to do this, right? But uh, anyhow, so that's this. I wanted to clear that up because it's important because you hear these people say, yeah, I took this pill and had this uh, allergic reaction the first time, okay? Now, this non-IEG, <laughs> the reason they don't really separate it too much is the signs and symptoms are the same, okay? So if we go back here, I'm glad that slide was there. Uh, you know, bronchoconstriction, capillary permeability, Okay, and this leads over to here. What happens here is in when this capillary starts to leak, and we, we spoke of this a little bit, they have different gates in here, okay? Some are voltage gated, some pressure. A lot of them are pressure, different pressures. Anyway, the release of that histamine does cause some vasodilation, which will drop the blood pressure, but it starts pushing the histamine starts uh, through a process, a chemical process, okay? It starts pushing the fluid out of these gates. It changes the permeability of that uh, capillary, so it starts pushing fluid out of there. So now you have edema and swelling. This is where you get it. Uh, they had a patient the other day that they, uh, in the hospital, we missed it. I, man, what a, what a miss. They did a cricoid thyroidomy on them. They had to do a surgical airway in, in the ER. It was emergent because this guy had angioedema or edema th to the throat. His throat was swelling shut. And they said that, that yeah, the, it was a Monday. And we missed everything. They said they landed two helicopters. Now, I mean, not all in the morning when we were there, but they landed two helicopters. They cracked this guy. They did all these different things. And we're like, wow, we missed out on that movie. You know? <laughs> Anyway, so it causes all this edema, all this swelling, the, the vasodilation and the, the movement of this fluid out of the capillaries is going to affect the blood pressure, and that's where you get anaphylactic shock that we spoke of, okay? Does that, does that clear a couple things up? So, thank goodness my, uh, they fixed, and I found, you know, they fixed my P drive and I had that original thing. I was in a panic, uh, but I did, I saved all my stuff yesterday, so I backed that up. I don't want to lose it, but let's watch this. This is, this is like a TV show that has no sound. This word is doctor. I do want to highlight to everyone what happens during an anaphylactic reaction because there is a difference between just a, a localized allergen or allergic reaction and true anaphylactic shock. This word is key because your body literally goes into shock when you have one of these reactions. Now it can happen with foods, medications, it can also happen with insect stings, with a bee sting for instance. Because what happens is when you're exposed to this allergen, whichever one it may or may not be, your body responds to it. This allergen, your body recognizes it as a foreign invader. It attaches to these antibodies. And what happens is these mast cells degranulate all this histamine. Now, if that histamine is just local, you might get a little local reaction. You might get a little bit of highs on your skin. But unfortunately, what can happen when it comes to anaphylaxis is within minutes of exposure to an allergen, Food allergies, for instance, an anaphylactic reaction can occur where you get swelling of the mouth, swelling of the tongue and lips called angioedema. You can actually get constriction of your airways, making breathing more difficult. Your airways may constrict, but what happens is your blood vessels may dilate and you'll have a systemic drop in your blood pressure. As all these things happen together, if you do not respond, you can die. And I'm not talking 
die in hours. I'm talking within 10 minutes if proper treatment is not given, someone can die. Now, what we have, luckily, is something called an EpiPen. This can be truly life-saving. This stays off what we call circulatory collapse. I want everyone to look at this label very closely. All you have to do is read. It's, it's quite simple. You're going to pull off the, the safety release, okay? And then you want to put it into a bigger muscle. So the thigh tends to be a very good spot for that. And literally, you're just going to auto-inject into the thigh, hold it for 10 seconds, and then you're going to want to call 911 and get help. Because without this, and I have to ask the two of you, I'm assuming that your friends, you taught your friends how to use this? Yeah, most of my friends how to use it. Because what you're going to see is if your friend, if it's, you know, if your friend has anaphylaxis, they're going to have potentially difficulty breathing, you're going to see potential swelling of the lips and tongue. But if they look at extremists like that, that model over there, that's time. That's when it's time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so very much for coming. Hey, Mr. What if that word is used mentioned in uh, trouble? Uh, but they uh, they just in those Latins. Gotta hate them. <laughs> but anyway, it, it is very important to to note that in and you're saying, well anybody does uh, anybody the person having the allergic reaction give them their own uh, EpiPen, which most of the time they can. But let me tell you that uh, even trained providers mess this up. They, they. Uh, I had a, a a former student, a first responder. She was allergic to bees. She got stung by a bee. She panicked. Okay, and she got her EpiPen out. I mean, she had a violent reaction to bees, and she she got her EpiPen out. She took that cap off and some way it got flipped around and she oh, did that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It went in her thumb. The time she got to uh, ED, because she had two EpiPens, and that's good. So she sort of, maybe this was the slap in the face that, you know, like, hey, whoa, <laughs> turn that thing around. <laughs> but uh, her, her thumb was black because of all the vasoconstriction, right? So what did they put on her thumb? You think what medicine they put on her thumb so they wouldn't have to amputate her thumb? Hmm? Nitro, because it's a what? Basal dilator. So what they did, they took nitro paste. Nitro comes in peel, right? And under sublingual, under the tongue, IV, IV drip, and then it comes in a paste where you can wear a paste. Anyway, they put nitro paste on there and uh, return the circulation uh, back. But she was trained, she was an EMT, she was a trained provider, and she still messed this up. So your, your, your friends and family can get into a panic. Uh, I, I tell everybody the, the reason that it's good to have a paramedic around is because that's not the person who's gonna panic, right? In a, in a medical crisis, if, if they do, then you suck at what you do, right? <laughs> I mean, but uh, I'm not gonna panic, I'm gonna, you know, we're gonna look at things and objectively and, and, and figure it out. And that should be you. You should be able to step away from that, even with a family member, step away from that and go, or a friend, and go, okay, if you're no longer mom, you're patient, and start thinking through a process, right? You have to take yourself out. If you don't take yourself out of the equation, then then you're you're not a you're not providing. You're you're actually a a, a relative or friend. You got to remove yourself from that. Anyway. So, just a side note. I mean, I've had my children get hurt. Some things I, I was just like, yeah, I can take care of this. I got this. Some other things that were a little bit more serious, I had uh, someone else look at them. I had my partner look at them or something, and I stepped away because I couldn't objectively uh, examine. I mean, I couldn't objectively do the assessment. So I stepped away and had my partner do it. So it happens. I mean, it happens like that. So. Uh, anyway, you're there. You have the knowledge and skills to save a life for sure. Well, let's talk about this right quick. This should be quick. It's not a heat emergency. We don't have that today or, well, or, or tomorrow. We're in December, <laughs> right? You know, but uh, we live in North Texas, so hopefully it will heat up soon. Uh, 
Anyway, so heat emergencies, hyper hyperthermia, okay? So the body gets too hot. Climate, North Texas, uh, it gets, the humidity is high, it gets hot. We sweat like pigs, right? Mm -hmm. Or hopefully we do. Sweating is the way that we cool the body off. If you don't sweat, you don't live in North Texas. You live up north somewhere where it doesn't get hot and humid. There, there is a disease, I don't know what it's called, but where you don't sweat, they don't sweat. You, we sweat to cool off. Okay, that's how we cool off. That's important, okay? We sweat and then air blows across us and it cools our body back off. Uh, to maintain homeostasis, the body does a lot of things, right? So, uh, climate is, is definitely it. Uh, exercise, activity. You know, hopefully some of these, the, at least the first one, the heat cramps, hopefully everybody has heat cramps before if you if you have it you don't get out enough okay you need to get out some more but old age young age the young age is very prominent um, may, you guys all have young maybe not brothers and sisters but young friends and little kids right mm -hmm. little kids it could be 150 degrees outside and they'll be running around like crazy playing <laughs> and all they're doing is playing and they have to have someone watching them make sure that they don't get the heat emergencies because they don't feel it they don't they just like boom they just go out and play and play and play and not not even feel the heat unless they're that kid that stays indoors all the time and plays video games i don't know but if you have an outside kid you have to watch them okay some some pre-existing illnesses or conditions thyroidism different things uh drugs medication help, uh, regulates body heat sometimes so uh especially illegal drugs it makes the patient feel too warm you know where they don't feel the cold right uh, i know you can't look at this too much i mean you can't really see it too much but some signs and symptoms a headache get too hot you start having a headache right? everybody sort of had a heat related headache got out there got too hot started having heat heat related breathing becomes a little bit more involved weakness right uh, we'll talk about skin temperature in a minute. That's a, that's one of those key signs and symptoms. When you get too hot, most people can't eat. Like I can't eat when it's really hot outside. I have to wait till it cool down. That's why you know if I'm you know before we moved, uh, we used to have a couple of acres where it took three hours to cut the grass. Uh, so uh, I would cut, and I like working in the heat of the day, but I. If I wasn't finished, I wouldn't come in to eat. I had to cool completely down to eat, all right? Because if I ate, then I'd get really nauseated. Weakness, and then you get really down in here where you, you start could have start having seizures, okay? We'll, we'll speak of that in a minute. And then cramps, you get muscle cramps and everything. Okay, so here's the three big ones that will focus on heat. Heat cramps. This is why I talk about everybody should have heat cramps. You should be active enough where you had, you're out there, you're doing something, you're playing take ball, this vigorous game of take ball, and you get sort of cramped up, you know, and you start getting these little cramps, right? Yeah. And those are heat cramps, okay? It's not really a medical, a huge medical emergency. On all these here, That it's the same sort of uh, thread. You remove this patient from the hot environment. If they're having a heat-related emergency, take them out of the hot environment, okay? So you have this guy here that's having these heat cramps, and he's sort of cramping up. He's still sweating. I mean, he still has a good flow of sweat, and he's just got these cramps and, you know, maybe a little nausea or whatever. So you pull this guy in to a cooler environment, whatever that might be. That might just be your car with the air conditioner, right? Or a fan or somewhere in the shade. It's, it is a lot cooler in the shade, okay? And you, you fan the patient, okay? Uh, you loosen their clothing up, and then you can take like tap water and wet around their neck and their chest, okay? And then uh, blow cool air on them and then fan them a little bit. If they're not nauseated, you can give them like some Gatorade or something, some water to sip on very important to sip, you don't want them throwing that back up, okay? And then, period of time, these cramps are gonna go away, 
And this person can go back out and play tape ball again. Same day. Go back to work. Whatever they were doing, they can resume that activity. Okay? If the cramps have gone away, they probably need some more electrolytes. That's when you would start drinking that Gatorade. Remember that the 3 to 1, 20 ounces of Gatorade, you need 60 ounces of water. Water is the main thing. Not Texas water. Iced tea. Sweet tea. Right? Can I tell you how many um, heat emergencies I went on? Like, are you, you drinking plenty of fluids? Yeah. I'm drinking a lot of fluid. What would that fluid be? Sweet tea. What else would I drink? Or beer. You know, yeah, <laughs> drinking a lot of fluid. Drinking a 12 pack, you know. But the, uh, so you, you get into that and all of a sudden, like, no, no, no. I'm talking about water. How much water have you had to drink? And like, none. You know, who drinks water, right? So uh, you, you have to rehydrate them, cool them down. Not a big thing, right? Heat exhaustion, on the other hand, okay, it's a medical emergency. This person may actually need IV fluids to rehydrate, but there's a there's those classic signs that I want you to remember here. On heat exhaustion, this patient will have profuse sweating. I mean, like pouring off of them. All right. Now, if you if you saw me in August on the golf course, because I went out in the heat of the day, because there's nobody there, I felt like I owned the place. Right? I, I mean, there's sweat. I, I'm a sweater. When I go out, I sweat a lot because I drink a lot of water, so I sweat. So he's like, oh no, you have heat exhaustion. You're sweating. You're profusely sweating. So I always do that. <laughs> the difference is, is that if you walked up and someone was just pouring sweat, uh, and you touch their skin, what, what temperature would you think their skin would be? Hot. It's, it's what you think. They're, they're sweating, man. They should be, they're hot, right? But if somebody else mentioned it, no, but in heat exhaustion, the skin is cold and clammy. Okay, so you, you see this person, remember before somebody raised it, presentation, you walk up, you're going, man, they're sweating a lot. And you reach down, grab a radio pulse, and you go, ugh. It's cold, clammy skin, sort of. Uh, yeah. Or, you know, it feels like you're touching a corpse or something. But the, uh, so you going, wow. So that's the classic sign of heat exhaustion, okay? They could be having cramps. Now, it doesn't run in order, okay? You can go straight into heat exhaustion or straight into heat stroke, okay? But they might be having cramps. They might be dizziness, nausea. Right? They, they may have these other signs and symptoms that we would treat, perhaps, okay? But they're sweating profusely and they have cold, clammy skin. And it's a period of, the onset is not very quick. Unless you are just like super dehydrated, it takes a while to get here, okay? Uh, if you're normally hydrated, then it, it takes it takes some time. But uh, anyway, so profuse sweating, cold, clammy skin. You would take this patient and remove them from the hot environment, uh, loosen the clothing, get some uh, tap water. I keep saying tap water, that lukewarm sort of water, okay? Because we don't put cold water. We'll see that in a second, okay? We'll wet them down. All right, uh, fan them, get them in a cool environment. Uh, probably this patient needs uh, IV, IVs to rehydrate because it takes forever to rehydrate with water. So they may need some uh, fluids to rehydrate, okay? They probably still need some electrolyte stuff, so some Gatorade type things. They might be having those cramps or those, those, those spasms. Right, that they get. And the difference here is that this person is done for some time. You need to advise them to stay out of the hot environment for, I mean, and I say days. Days. So if you, this person, let's say if this happened on, uh, this person was out working on Monday, you they would probably be able to uh, 
if they were rehydrated, rehydrated IV, they might be able to return to work by, I would say, Thursday, maybe. Okay? Because what happens is, once you get a heat-related emergency, past heat cramps, okay, uh, you're more susceptible to that emergency again. You're more susceptible to that heat. So if this person got the IVs, they got all, their cells all happy again, and boom, the next day, went back to work, back out into the heat, more than likely this is going to reoccur faster. Okay, so they need some time to, to rest, to stay cool, cool environment, and to continue to hydrate with water. Okay, but, uh, so that's heat exhaustion. Everybody good with that? I mean, it is a true medical emergency. This person has to have some medical treatment. But it's, it's easily fixed if, if it's taken care of. All right? Now, the mother of all heat-related emergencies, heat stroke. Heat stroke is a life-threatening emergency. Uh, it occurs when the body core temperature rises above 105 degrees. Okay, uh, this patient is on the verge, if not unconscious, they are unconscious, altered mental status, seizures, cramping, they can be posturing up, you know, going in. On sort of the cusp between heat exhaustion and heat stroke, that patient will start to, to sort of, they're not posturing like a head injury like we talked about, they're just going up, they start cramping up. Okay, and then uh, they could have nausea, vomiting, seizures, altered mental status, okay? But truly a life-threatening emergency. The telltale signs of that is no sweating or very little sweating, okay? This is why that you watch those little young kids. They stop sweating, you need to pull Johnny in quickly. They get all flushed out and they look like they're not sweating very much. You need to get them inside and cool them off, okay? <clears throat> but this person is sweating very little or not at all. And their skin is hot to the touch. So when you touch their skin, you go, oh, wow, that's hot, okay? Because they are hot. They're in heat stroke, okay? Here, with the water and the fans and you know, the cool environment is called passive cooling off. Passive cooling this patient off. Here we would aggressively cool the patient off, but that doesn't mean that we throw ice water on the patient, okay? Uh, I can't, can't tell you the times that we dumped ice water on the patient. You know, it's at a football game one time, a man person of all places, I mean, they're in that weird band uniform that's all hot, right? I mean, they are they are hot. They, I could see him walking up to him. I'm walking towards him, and then I mean, I'm like, oh, okay, heat heat emergency. Got this because I can see it, you know, walking up to him, and then uh, a parent dumps ice water on their head. <laughs> I'm like, okay, great. No more heat emergency. Get there, and the patient's shivering. Now they have a cold emergency. Okay, but it's it's light. We'll go into that in a minute. It, it's life-threatening to do that. You never do that. Uh, anyway, so passive cooling off, aggressive cooling off would be the same thing. Get that person out of the hot environment, okay? If you have chemical cold packs, <clears throat> the ones you hit and move like that, shake up, <clears throat> then you would place those chemical cold packs on the carotids underneath the armpits and the femorals. So as that blood flows through there, it's cooling that blood off, okay? In the hospital, you will see them get a blanket over there and blow cold air on them. They will start IVs and uh, cool off the IV fluid. They're going cold fluid through them, okay? To cool them off. Uh, Pre-hospital, we tape a chemical cold crack around the IV tube and to cool it off and hang it from the air conditioner. Uh, but uh, so we won't cool fluid through them. 
ice packs on the carotids, the armpits, and the and the femorals. Okay, wet them down. Don't soak them. Fan them. Get them out of the cool. Protect their airway. Remember, they could be unconscious. Protect their airway. Watch for vomiting, suctioning. Right. Evaluate the need for oxygen. These different things, but it's a it's more of aggressive cooling because this is life threatening. Okay. When do you know, and take a temperature, try to get a body temperature, okay? In the hospital, they do a rectal to get the right temperature, okay, to get the core temperature. Uh, out in the park, who, who carries a rectal thermometer with them, right? Okay, but you might have a thermometer, get a, get a regular oral temperature or whatever to give you a baseline. It may not be the exact temperature, but get a temperature for the baseline, okay? When do you know if the patient's getting too cold? Shiver, shiver. Very good. They start to shiver. So you would take all those ice packs off, right? And start start not cooling them off so fast. So the patient will start to shiver. Okay? Very important. Uh, for the trainers in the room, this used to happen all the time with two days. Because the the guys would get out there, they're in those pads, it's August. Who does that in August? But they, uh, they get out there and they, they want water, and the coaches would say, Why? Mm -hmm. No water. Mm -hmm. Water's for wimps. Get back. No water's for people who are thirsty. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and, uh, you know, they wouldn't give them any water. They wanted to toughen them up. Well, that's not the way you tough, toughen people up. Uh, by killing them. <laughs> and, and, and that's what they did. For years, we had these uh, football players dropping dead on the football field mm -hmm. and going into heat stroke and having permanent uh, disabilities of it because the coaches wouldn't give them any water. Uh, after a number of years, they they educated people and they now they, they give them a lot of water breaks. And they don't do it if it's too hot. They don't even practice it if it's too hot outside. They have a sort of a, a temperature match, okay? It's just like cops uh, in diabetic emergencies. A lot of people died in jail because they thought they were drunk and they were uh, hypoglycemic, right? So, uh, or hyperglycemic, either one. So you, this little education helps here, but this, this person here is done for a long time. You can't go out in that hot environment for a long period of time. You're really susceptible to those heat heat emergencies, okay? Uh, one thing that heat stroke will do is it will affect the long-term memory, okay? Uh, I've known guys who were, uh, they, they long-term is in the morning to the evening. They couldn't figure out what, they couldn't remember what they had for breakfast. Okay, uh, and then it affects the, the, the longer-term memory as well. So there's, there's lasting effects to this. You have to be very, very careful with, with heat stroke and heat exhaustion to get them brought back out into the environment. Back to that football player, heat exhaustion, days. They're going to miss days of practice, or they should. Uh, you don't want them to be more, get another heat-related injury. Everybody good with sort of the classics there, yeah. and and the difference. What is the temperature for a heat stroke on a patient? Here, 105. 105 on the average. They get up to about 105. All right. So, you know, here's sort of an algorithm sort of to go through. But if you just remember the, uh, the, the big things, are they sweating, uh, are they cramping, are they hot, are they cold? Either way, get them out of the, the, the environment and then start to cool them off one, one, either passively or aggressively, depends on the circumstance, okay? And just a list of those. Muscle cramping, rapid breathing, pulse, their mental status is normal. All right, uh, with the heat cramps, not not too much. You notice the uh, they still have the muscle cramps, but heavy heavy sweating, profuse sweating. They can be they can have an altered mental status, so that's something to watch out for. All right, so to notice the signs around them, 
you know, pick up crews, ask them questions related to the heat, you know, especially fluid intake, fluid output, okay? Uh, I've been in some hot environments, okay? I mean, you think Texas is hot, go to India. Holy cow. It's... <laughs> I know, but my word. <laughs> I, I drank gallons of water and didn't urinate all day <laughs> because every everything I drank I sweat out. I mean you were constantly sweating. I mean it's in the it's so hot and humid the humidity here. Matter of fact, when I got back into I got back one time in August and I was cold. I put on a jacket in August and tried to get my body acclimated back to the coolness of North Texas. Okay, I mean it was it was really hot. Uh, so there's there's different places that are a lot hotter. Let me tell you, but uh, I can't even. It, it's hard to describe. But uh, uh, you just get used to sweating. You know, drink drink water, sweating. Uh, mm. So BSI, cool the patient, remove them. Remove them from the hot environment. Make sure that you're wa watching out for these things. It's really hot, dry skin with heat stroke. No pers no sweating, a little bit of sweating. Altered mental status, seizures. When they start seizing, that's, that's that near-death experience. They're walking towards the light when they start to seize, okay? So uh, there's a lot of things that could take place. We want to really cool them off as... as uh, fast as we can without jumping uh, ice water on them. Now, if you don't have these chemical cold packs, you can get ice packs, okay, and put there, but just monitor their temperature a little bit closer, because the, the chemical cold packs only get so hot, I mean so cold, but the ice will freeze, right? So monitor the skin, put something under the skin, and then uh, they'll get cooled off a lot quicker, okay? Am I good with heat, heat related emergencies? Good. Uh, if you don't, and, and you can do this, you're out at the park or, or wherever, and, and you notice that, you can at least get them in, in the shade. Let me tell you, I learned how in India, I learned how to walk in the shade. I would, I would cross the street out of my way to go and walk in the shade. <laughs> versus the, the, the temperature. There was probably a 30 degree difference in temperature, okay, which made a big difference. So this person that's out in the park with you, get them in the shade, okay, fan them, wet them down, take that, not that tea bottle, but take that water bottle like this is lukewarm water, sort of. Let me get on. <laughs> <laughs> Pull that water on them, okay? and then fan them down, cool, cool them down. This won't hurt them at all. It just acts as plain as sweat, but you like sweat and cool them down, fan them down, okay? Then you can start cooling that temperature, that body temperature off. Okay, so code, code related emergencies. This is big, a hypothermia. Everybody's heard of hypothermia, okay? It things that take place really quick, okay? Just a plug for you guys, okay? And uh, how many of you, everybody drive? Mm -hmm. Okay, if you drive, this is what you need to do tonight, okay? If you already haven't done it, mom and dad may have already taken care of this for you, okay? But if you drive, you need to put a blanket in your car. You need to put an extra jacket that you don't take out of your car, okay? In the cold environment, in, this is not cold. People are laughing at us because we think it's going to be cold. Really? Yeah, you can go up north and it's negative five degrees, right? Yeah. They're going, whatever. <laughs> they come down here in the summer and, you know, they're hot in Wyoming. They say, whoo, heat struck, heat wave. Come on down to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But uh, anyway, put a blanket in there. Put a little food in there for you, a little snack, something that, like crackers or something, okay? 
and then uh, make sure that you have plenty of gas. So if you need gas, okay, and mom or dad said, well, you need to buy it. You just have to wait till you get money. But mom, it's supposed to be cold. You need gas money. Yeah. So, uh, because you could easily get stuck. Lubbock had 10 inches of snow the other day. Well, about it, right? You get stuck on the side of the road, you can run your car with the heater. Why don't you crack a window because of carbon monoxide poisoning, right? But crack a little window, but the, uh, unless you run out of gas, or unless your car just won't run, but you have a breakdown and it's cold. And your car's not running, and of course, nobody's going to stop and help you, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody goes, drive by and go, sucks to be them. <laughs> right? But the, uh, the breakdown, all right, you used every ounce of your battery on Snapchat instead of, you know, now your battery's dead, right? And so uh, it doesn't take long to get really cold really quick in a, a, a steel box. The home room box, right? So, car, you get it, it happens really quick. Uh, keep in mind if you're wet, you lose body temperature 25 times faster. Okay, so it's imperative if this is a patient to get them dry. Okay, but anyway, do that for yourself. Be prepared. I have like three coats in my thing, I always have food. Okay, so uh, be, be prepared for the cold weather. You, you just never know, you know. Ho ho hopefully not a breakdown or anything like that, but you never know. You won't just be be like Boy Scouts, be prepared, okay, with this, not freeze to death. It, it happens, it happens every year. You hear people freezing to death in their cars because they get stuck in their cars, okay? So, uh, cost is that. The, the flip side of it, the heat, have, always have some water with you, right? But, Cold things can happen quick. So, so do that. That's your homework. <clears throat> yeah. So you have this big thermometer here, and you start seeing things. They get cold. They get paired. You know, they're alert. They start to shiver. The shiver is the body's way to generate heat, okay? The muscle coordination goes down. As the body gets colder in the, in the lower 90s, right? 995, start getting some edema. <laughs> Some change your heart rate starts to slow down it starts to slow down because the body's trying to preserve itself trying to slow down metabolism conserve heat okay that's why we have to eat during the winter time okay that's my excuse anyway I eat more in the winter because you need the heat you need the carb you need the fuel to keep warm your body needs to burn that carbohydrates okay keep warm so enjoy the pizza it's 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 cold let's get some pizza uh, you get really sort of rigid slow slow breathing down this is what happens to bears during the when they hibernate their heart rate drops really slow they breathe really slow they just they just have enough going on to to live right and then uh, 80s woo, gets really cold here uh, so respira respiration, real slow heart rate. You're wondering if the patient's uh, dead because you don't you don't really see. They can only be breathing three four times a minute. Pulse. Someone in a cold related emergency that's unconscious. You need to check the pulse for a full minute, carotid, or an apical pulse. Take that Walmart stethoscope, right, and listen right here. Listen for a minute for the heart, heartbeat, okay? There's, I think I have it broke down later, but there's an expression, you're not dead until you're warm and dead. <clears throat> so the, the patient that's in a cold-related emergency, you warm them up and then decide whether or not they're dead, okay? So do that and then cyanosis, cardiac arrest, down here where, where it gets really cold. Uh, decreasing mental status, they get sort of angry, they real just uncoordinated, real sort of stiff and rigid, start to shiver, you know, changing in vital signs like we talked about, 
slow pulse, slow breathing, uh, uh, pressure really starts to drop. Okay. The cool thing, or <laughs> the cool thing, <laughs> get it? <laughs> uh, the cool thing is that same sort of treatment, get this patient out of the cold environment, right? Warm them up. If they're wet, if their clothing is they're saturated, strip them. Get those clothes off. Okay? You've got to take them. Yeah. You've, you've got to remove those clothes. Long as they, they're wet, they're still retaining that. They're still losing body heat. Right? We lose heat. Okay? We don't get cold. We lose heat. Okay? So that, that wetness is zapping that, that heat from us. Okay, get them, get them, get them stripped, get them warm, get blankets on them, get cool, warm air, warm air with them, right? Dry them off completely, get them all dried off, warm them up, all right? That's sort of a passive way. What do you think the aggressive way is to warm them up? Set them on fire. <laughs> 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 Pour hot water. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pour water. Yeah. Yeah. Cover them in blankets. Pour boiling hot water. <laughs> this may hurt, but it'll warm you up. <laughs> <laughs> and then on to burn emergencies. <laughs> uh, chemical heat packs, right? Heat packs. Oh, yeah. Break them up. Now, the difference between chemical cold packs and chemical Ouch. heat packs Ouch. is the chemical cold pack. It doesn't get cold enough to freeze, okay? The chemical heat pack gets hot enough to burn. Those things are hot, okay? So you can't put them directly on the skin, but you would do the same thing. You would take them crotted under the pits, the femorals, right? Cover them up with blankets. Blow hot air on them. They'll get a bear hugger in the hospital, blow hot air on them. Get a body temperature, okay? You need a baseline. So get a temperature, okay? I guess if they get too hot, they'll start sweating, okay? But they probably won't get that way. You'll have to reassess the patient and continue to take that body temperature, okay? If someone's really, really hypothermic, they will put, uh, I don't know if it was last year they did this, uh, they put a, a, a rectal probe, that almost, that sounds bad, <laughs> but a thermometer, rectal thermometer uh, in that stayed there and they attached it to another uh, monitor which constantly gave them their uh, body temperature, their core temperature, okay? But it stayed there, it wasn't an in and out thing like a rectal temperature. Alright? So, warm them up. Pre-hospital, what we would do is uh, IVs in the in the Winter time, we would put our IV bags where the defroster was and constantly blew hot air on them. In the in our helicopter, we put them in a pizza bag, pizza warmer, oh. and we always had warm IV fluid, so we would switch out IV fluids to make sure they were warm. We could take the chemical hot packs and tie them around the, uh, the IV tubing to, to warm it up as it came in, okay? So they'd give them warm fluids in, okay? So that's sort of getting them out of the, the cold environment. Uh, very important, can't overextress the thing about getting them dry, making sure they're dry, blankets, okay? Uh, get that body temperature up. All right, so this is what I'm talking about here. Years ago, uh, you know, we had these different, they, they come up with these different chal challenges. I don't know. Uh, why would anybody eat Thai pods? I mean, so, I mean, what, why do that? There's another one coming up. What's that new one coming up? Oh, breaking in stores and staying there overnight. And, oh, oh, oh so there's some good videos. <laughs> <laughs> what did they do? Most, of Most of the time, you look at this and you want the definition of stupidity. <laughs> You, you can have a list, okay? But this was, I forget, maybe it was ALS to bring attention to ALS or whatever, where they did that cold bucket. Yeah, yeah. That's a little, 
That turned to the stupid side, okay? Because of what it caused. It actually caused deaths. No, they didn't. You didn't hear about this on the news, okay? It actually caused some fatalities and, and heart attacks. Because as I label it, it's the perfect storm, okay? What takes place is we have cold shock, okay? And what? And these are receptors on the skin. And so uh, what happens is when we get really, when we go into cold shock, like the ice being poured over our skin, we go into cold shock, okay? The heart rate shoots up. All right, hang in there with me, okay? So it shoots up, so now the patient gets tachycardic. But as it, that cold water goes over the face, the receptors on the face, it creates a vagal response, okay? And that vagal response slows the heart rate down. So you have, yeah, exactly. You have one response driving the heart rate up and one response driving the heart rate down, okay? Okay, they had a big word for it, not the perfect storm, but autonomic conflict. There's too many inputs, okay? You accelerate, then slows, you hit the brakes and slow it down. What this caused is, caused an 82% having an arrhythmia or an irregular heart rhythm, okay? Which is big. The older you are, the worse it is. You guys, maybe not so bad, but... An old person, older person, no, not that. I'm just waiting for the day, you know, on these football teams, you know, they're, they're, they got the old coach coming off and go, yeah, we won again, yeah. He's trying to make his way over to the sidelines to shake the hand and they come up with the Gatorade and they go, congratulations, coach. And, and yeah, he go, oh. <laughs> 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 But you see some of those older coaches, they don't pour that Gatorade on those old guys. They got enough of that. But if they knew this, then they would like, and give that away from me. But it causes too many inputs. Like I said, 82% had arrhythmias, electrical disturbs, disturbances, which can lead to an MI or ventricular fibrillation, lethal rhythm, right? So they could have a heart attack, they could have this, EKGs were showing ST elevation. What it is, there's too many inputs. Don't do this, but I'll tell you, okay? Take your sports car out in the parking lot and hit, hit it. Hit that gas pedal as hard as you can, right? And the car will go, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And then slam the brake. Hit the gas, let it accelerate, no, then, 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 then slam on the brake. You know what will probably happen? Yeah, 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 but what is going to happen to the engine? It's going to stop. The engine will probably go... All right. Too many inputs. You try to accelerate and then stop too soon and too many inputs. This is what causes that when you pour that cold water over people's heads, you cause this autonomic conflict. So you never would do that, okay? If they do it, and there has been times, I've seen it in the desert, high desert, okay? It's like 130 degrees on the surface, okay? They fly this guy in, he's in he got heat stroke, and uh, they have a horse trough there about the size of your desk, and they, they run this guy over there, the difference is they have these other guys standing there going, those are the doctors, ready to resuscitate the patient, okay? The other guy standing way back over going, those were the convicts that their only job in life was to stand out in 130 degree heat and keep that water a certain temperature. I, I watched them. They go over and measure the water and they get ice and come over and pour ice in there, stir it up, another guy would come over with a, a little thermometer or whatever, check the water, the ice, and that's that's what they did all day long. But the, uh, and, and everybody's watching them going, man, I wish I could get in that thing. But the, uh, 
So they took this guy and threw him in the water. Okay, so they were ready to resuscitate the patient. Uh, that that would be the, the only only time that I've I've seen. You know, they would do that. But that's that's extreme measures, right? So we wouldn't do that. You you cause this for sure. Uh, it's not worth taking the chance of, of that killing you, right? To prove a point. If if you want to contribute to like whatever this was for, a, ALS or whatever, send them money. <laughs> they need your. They need money more than they need you pouring a bucket of ice water on their heads, right? Drink the ice water. Send them money. Right, so that'd be that'd be better. So don't allow them to, this code. Back to this code person. Remove them from the environment. Don't allow them to walk. Don't allow them to rub their hands together because they could be sort of slushy, frozen in there. Okay, you don't want soft tissue injuries because they start rubbing. They're really, really cold. Okay, they don't want to walk anyway because it would probably hurt too much if their feet's involved. Okay, uh, not dead till you're warm and dead. We don't make assumptions, so make sure we warm them up. Check that pulse for a long time. We do compressions on them until they warmed up. If they were in cardiac arrest, we if we felt that way, all right. Then uh, just other things that can happen a lot quicker, like frostbite. It's not really hypothermia, but it, uh, you can have frostbite, especially on the exposed, your nose, your ears, right, your head. <laughs> you don't have any hair up here. Exposed skin, uh, your fingers. So you have to sort of watch for that. I think I have a picture. Oh yeah. Oh. oh. So the, the, those are like burns in the. Yeah, this is just fluid accumulation, sort of like a second degree burn, but it's not a burn. It's just sort of. So that is frostbite. So you get frostbite. Feet get really cold. Okay. Uh, as it progresses, yeah, it can, it can start getting necrosis, start turning black and green and different colors, okay? So just one little hole in the nose. So deep, deep frostbite. It looks like it's changing in the Well, this is like almost no circulation here. So you, you, you start warming these up, but it's a, it's a, Toss of the dice whether or not they're actually going to be able to save them and save the feet, right? So you do get worse in there the same way you would start warming them up. You're not going to allow that person to walk on those feet. They're not going to walk anyway because it, it, it hurts too much. Okay, the same way with the hands. Don't rub them uh, and, then, and then start warming, warming them up. If you lived up north, and, and uh, you were in some form of medicine, then you'd go a lot into frostbite and hypothermia and different things. Uh, it, it's it's a bit it's a bit more. But the main thing is when these hot and cold things warm them up or cool them off. That's that's the. And then are you don't do that quickly or you don't do it. Sort of passively, and those are that's the decision tree that you you have to sort of make. Right. Oh, one thing: remove the rings. Okay, don't don't break the blisters. Okay, why the rings and stuff? Is about swelling. You lose circulation. It acts sort of as a little tourniquet. Okay, so make sure that you. You remove those. Everybody good? Yeah. We got one more. Can y'all hang in there a few more minutes? Bites and stings. You guys good? Let's, let's just finish it up. Yeah. Okay. You get bit by something. Ouch. Starts to swell. A, a spider, uh, a bee, a snake, whatever, whatever the case may be. Okay. Uh, you protect the wound. You sort of trying to identify what bit the patient. So if this patient came in uh, and you're examining that, they say I got bit by some sort of bug. You try to identify what kind of bug, right? Uh, different things take 
take different uh, uh, bites on them. So we don't really, sometimes we don't know, sometimes we know uh, it can have an allergic reaction. You can have an anaphylactic shock from these different things, okay? Just depends on, depends on what bit, what bit you. This is a very common looking injury here. This is not what you think it is, but if you look at that, what would you think? What? Could be a burn. What else would you think? This looks infected, right? Yeah. yeah. You don't have to be in medicine to know that. That looks bad. <laughs> you need to get that looked at. Right? Okay. Let me tell you what, it really looks like at first glance, if we wouldn't talk about bites and stings, I'm like, you you have a staph infection. It looks like staph. Okay. Yeah, it looks like a staph infection. This sort of white part here, pus, it's like uh, glue. It's real sort of thick. Okay, this is a little pus pocket here. And it's sort of thick. Okay, but uh, so it, it could be a staph infection. It could be some form of cellulitis, right? Or in our case, bites and stings. It's a brown recluse bite. Okay, so we look at this brown recluse. A brown recluse is, has. I don't know if I have a picture of, but they have the little fiddle back on them. Okay, and uh, that's how you. No, that it's a brown recluse. It's called a recluse because it's recluse. It hides in cold, damp environments, okay? So, you know, if you're cleaning out your closet, and Texas has a brown, North Texas has a lot of brown recluses, okay? <laughs> Most of them are dead now or hibernating or something. They don't move, don't move out. Summertime, springtime, yeah, we, we have a lot of Recluses, so you have to watch where you're digging in back for that pair of sandals. They like that. They like that environment. When I lived out in the country, we had a continuous thing that we did because we had them all over. We'd we'd have shoes on the ground. We'd pick up our shoes and hit them together. Right? Okay. So uh, one one thing about a recluse bite is it's painless. The patient usually doesn't even know that they've been bit. All of a sudden, this pops up. Ooh. Okay? And then, again, it doesn't matter what field you're in, this pops up on your thumb, you're going, man, I think I should take, get, get that looked at. <laughs> <laughs> right? yep. And then they say, yeah, it's going to be a recluse bite. And they, what they do, they take this little special tool, it looks like that, you know, a strawberry, uh, the green part of the strawberry, yeah. that cuts that green part of the strawberry out. What they'll do, they'll take that tool, they'll numb that and dig that out. And then you have to pack it for about a week or so, okay? And wow. keep packing it. And they'll give you antibiotics, okay? If you don't get it taken care of, this takes place. Continues to grow. If you don't get it taken care of, this takes place. Lunch. Welcome to lunch. Okay. That's a that's a brown recluse, a spider bite. Right. Now, I can sort of see. Yeah, I'm a tough guy. I'm not going to go to the doctor about that. This, like, heck yeah. Okay. They just put a band aid over it. Here, well, that's a little stupidity. You're getting a hole eaten in your leg. You know. Then you get here and you have permanent damage to it. Mm. What happens with the recluse, it's, it's pretty cool. Do you have a picture of it? Yeah. I don't know. Can you consult with the science? Yeah, so we know what it was. You have the recluse bot here. Oh and what happens is... You have the recluse bot. Somebody calling about treatment for brown recluse. Oh, I know. Anyway, the, the recluse builds up this, it puts this ring, this toxic ring around the bite, which is pretty fascinating if you start stop thinking about it. It puts this sort of toxic ring around the bite here. And the antibodies, remember the Ys? 
they come up here and they can't get in because this top of the brain. Oh. And if you don't get this removed, this that center part removed, it will continue to grow. That's key. Okay? And so, from a little spider. Otherwise, it's painless. Uh, it, it requires treatment. Uh, you, you have to, the doctor or PA or whoever has to dig that, that part out. If you don't, this don't cause tissue necrosis. You end up with permanent. But remember, no, no, uh, no pain. Just sort of a painless spider body. Yeah, yeah. and they're 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 all over the place in the spring and summer, uh, in in this in this area. Okay, the other spider spider that we talk about that's pretty common is the black widow. However, the black widow bite, the little hourglass on its back, okay, the black widow is painful. When the black widow bites you, it is painful. It, it can cause systemic effects, meaning that in the system, so it can cause seizures, abdominal rigidity, right, nausea, vomiting, tremors, unconsciousness. So it, it, a black widow can cause more serious side effects to it, okay? You, you have to go and get treatment for the black widow. Now, they will still treat signs and symptoms, okay? But they're very common. Wood piles, boxes, outdoors, uh, they're not a recluse. They're out in the open. You can see these black widows. A brown recluse is going to be the ones in the shed under the bed. They're, they're under your bed, and they're not so recluse. They they come out at night and stand, sit on, sit on your pillow and go. I think I'm gonna bite that. Yeah. They, uh, they're pretty recluse, okay? And then you have these black widows. So you, you sort of see, it's hard to see that way. I'm going to see the plastic bag. <laughs> see the hourglass, sort of there. But the difference is, is one, it's a different, different presentation, but two, uh, it is painful. That's how you know the difference between a recluse and maybe a different spider different kind of spiders, okay? Uh, some spiders, they don't, they bite you and you just get a localized reaction. They're not, they don't have any poison in them. They're just like, oh, something bit me. I can't tell you how many times, you know, you wake up and you go, you know, it's like something bit me. Was it a mosquito? Was it a small spider? What, <laughs> but it was none. It didn't really cause any size effect. Put a little Benadryl cream on it, go them away, you know? Huh? Was that poison? Yeah, sort of a harder. It's not like a recluse bite, which yeah, which is thick and sort of like glue. This is sort of a harder. Thing. How do you treat? Uh, do you treat signs and symptoms? So you can't do anything. Yeah, you just treat the signs and symptoms on it. Okay. So now snake bites, because we we have a lot of snakes, rattlesnakes. Water moccasins or copperheads, whatever you want to call them. Okay, a rattlesnake is and not an aggressive snake. It's a defensive snake. If you leave it alone, it leaves you alone. Okay. Now, on the other, other hand, a copperhead, like if you're down by the the, the lake, and if you're in that a water moccasin, they call them all these different things. You know the brown snakes. But if you're down there, and uh, if you're by their nest, I know this for sure because it happened a few times. Uh, fishing out the pond or whatever, they will leave that water and chase you down. <laughs> yeah, they're they're like, well, you you see them sort of floating around out in the water, and you're going, wow, that's a big snake. Why is that snake coming at me? <laughs> you win. <laughs> snake one, okay. Uh, there used to be. All different kinds of remedies for snake bites, okay? Uh, I'll go down through a couple. You, you'll find them rather hilarious, but they really actually did this. Uh, they would look at that and go, I'm going to suck that poison out. <laughs> so they'd make a little cut on it. Yeah. They used to sell these kits with the razor blade in it and a little suction cup in it. Oh. Okay. The cowboys would go, Ugh. 
Okay. The fangs, the rattlesnake fangs are like hypodermic needles. They inject. Yeah. So think about this. Think about the thing. You get an injection of some sort. Boom. Oh, no. wrong, wrong medicine. <laughs> really? Is, is that going to work? No. no. It's already in the muscle. It's probably already in the bloodstream of some sort, the capillaries. That's not going to work. No. Uh, they used to put constricting bands on there where they would tie a tourniquet on there and move the tourniquets and everything. Uh, put ice on it. Do all this thing. <clears throat> the current treatment is to leave it alone. <laughs> okay, treat signs and symptoms, leave it alone. Okay, uh, a rattlesnake, just like a, uh, do I have a picture of a different kind yeah. of snake? No, a, a rattlesnake. Is that an arm? That would be a foot, I think. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> a rattlesnake, you need to go where they have rat the venom, the anti venom. So, uh, you know, you're out about to get bit by a snake or, or whatever, and they would, you would want to make sure that where you're going, you call them and get, uh, that they have anti-venom for it. All right, the rattlesnake. Not everybody carries the rattlesnake anti-venom. So that, that's something that you would need to do beforehand. You don't want to show up and then all of a sudden, like, wrong place, we don't have rattlesnake anti-venom. Okay? So the, uh, that that would be something there, but leave it alone. Don't don't mess with it. Okay. And then the the last thing we don't really get too much into this is the marine animals. But you get in, you know, you go down to the coast, you get out in the water, you get these jellyfish and different things. Okay. Why uh, would I look I looked this up? Some time ago, and they said that. Uh, the, Thing with it is, it depends on what type of jellyfish that you stink. Everybody comes up with all these different things. Okay, put tobacco juice on it, yeah. urinate on it, right? All these different things inside. Yeah. <laughs> nah, it, it's really dependent upon the the fish. It's the type of marine life, the jellyfish. It is. Some you use uh, vinegar. Others, it's salt water. Yeah, so, right. so some it's vinegar. It just depends on what geographic area that you're in. In Cozumel, I got stung by one on my back. And it was it was painful and, and itched, but Benadryl cream and a couple of Tylenol. Right? But uh, I definitely didn't have someone urinate on my back. <laughs> but the uh, <laughs> here, here I got pee right there. Uh, but some of it's the the vinegar or salt water. So sometimes you just need to get back into the salt water and rinse it off. Some of them are is fresh water. So you really have to know what type that, that bit you, okay? To, to really know for sure. So let's say you're on vacation, you're at the beach, you're not really sure, you just start trying. Every time. You know, uh, well, I, let's say I got bit on the hand, I go and rinse it with salt water, well, that didn't work, so I pour fresh water on it. Okay, back to the vinegar, you know. Well, that, none of that works. Oh, well, suck it up, <coughs> vinegar cream. And, <laughs> but the, the local people will be able to help you with these different things. Okay? They will they'll be able to help you out. Oh what? Everybody good with bites and stings? Yeah. Biggest thing with that, watch out for that allergic reaction. It's the biggest thing with bites and stings. Okay? Oh, one other thing, right quick. Bee stings. Bee sting, the bee leaves the stinger in your skin. Okay? Scrape it out. Scrape it out. It's like a hypodermic needle. You don't take a pair of tweezers and squeeze it. That if you squeeze it, you can inject more bee juice into you, right? So you take your driver's license or something and scrape it out. The stinger out.
Alright. That's morning now.